Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the anthem. Good morning, guys. Um, it's been about two weeks since my last video. Um, this is Ramon Thomas from the sunny side of South Africa. This week I want to talk about a article written by a student who graduated from Rhodes University in Grahamstown and who was involved in the Fees Must Fall protest. So let me first recap what Fees Must Fall was about. Fees Must Fall is a student-led protest movement that began in 2015 led by the University of Advertisrand Student Representative Council. Protest started at the University of Advertisrand and spread to University of Cape Town and Rhodes University in Grahamstown before rapidly spreading to other universities across the country. The 2015 protest ended when it was announced by the South African government that there would be no tuition fee increases for 2016. The protest in 2016 began when the South African Minister of Higher Education announced that there would be a fee increase capped at 8% for 2017. However, each institution was given the freedom to decide how much their tuition would increase. By October 2016, the Department of Education estimated that the total cost of property damage due to protests had amounted to 600 million rand, equivalent of about 45 million US dollars. So why do I care about fees must fall in South Africa? I did my undergraduate degree and graduated in 1996. I had two loans. Uh, the first year I had a bank loan. Uh, my mother was an employee of First National Bank. And in the second and third year, I had a loan from what is now called NESFAS, a government um, institution or controlled institution that offers student loans. I had to pay that back. There was no way for me to get free education. Anybody who is able to get to a university, to qualify for a university, to study at a university, whether they can pay or not, whether their parents can pay or whether they have to take a loan, you need to be damn grateful. During apartheid, there was limitations on what you could do. I know that um, my father, for example, and my mother's brother ended up working in construction. Well, neither of them finished matric. So this video is mostly about um, a junior journalist at the Daily Maverick, an online newspaper in South Africa called Apiwe Ngalo. Now, who is Apiwe Ngalo? She is a graduate from Rhodes University and she attended Victoria Girls High School according to her LinkedIn profile. Um, having a cursory look at her blog, taking a cursory look at her blog, uh, I found an article from September 6, 2017 with the title, Not Everything is as Simple as Boy and Girl, where she talks about heteronormativity and gender binaries. And she goes on a, a rant about sexual education and uh, parents teaching um, their children about uh, the penises inserted into the vagina, as well as um, when you're shopping, that um, the clothes fit neatly into the uh, male and female brackets. So this gives you an indication of, um, you could say, that her philosophy and outlook on life. So it's no, no surprise to me that she's written about... Um, uh, fragile masculinity, the real topic that I want to get to, which is um, the article she wrote on 12 April in Daily Maverick, um, graduating from varsity after being, after fees must fall is a bittersweet experience. I'm not going to read the article as such to you. You can do that yourself, but I want to give you my commentary um, and to put things into context, really. Rhodes University in South Africa, let me say something about that, um, that institution. It is one of the premier universities in Africa, and um, I think it certainly qualify as one of the top universities, top 200, I would say, in the world. It was the first university to get an internet connection um, in the late 80s, and I've been invited to conferences at Rhodes University for several years, between 26 
2006 and um, 2008, I attended a conference called Highway Africa, um, which is the largest journalism conference in the Southern Hemisphere. Rhodes University is distinguished by its um, journalism faculty or the Department of Journalism and Media Studies. And I know quite a few of the graduates that have gone on to uh, become editors and uh, managing editors of um, newspapers around South Africa. So they have a good track record of producing really good journalists. I think where things get a little messed up for me with um, Apiwe and, and, her, uh, and her graduation is, firstly, there's just a complete lack of gratitude for the opportunity. There are so many young people in South Africa that can't even dream of studying after matric, not just because of financial reasons, but in many cases they just don't qualify because of the poor state of um, public education or public schooling. So they can't even apply. I, I remember in my own case, when I finished um, high school, I wouldn't even dare apply to University of Cape Town, Stellenbosch or Rhodes University. I ended up um, doing my BSc degree at Vista University, which uh, no longer exists. And um, well, she got to study at Rhodes University and she graduated. So she talked about how hypocritical the institution was or higher education is in South Africa. And I just want to give you some background about this university. You know, although a proposal was um, found. So let me tell you more about Rhodes University. Again, I'm taking some excerpts from Wikipedia because I'm a Wikipedia editor myself. Although a proposal to found a university in Grahamstown had been made as early as 1902, financial problems caused by the frontier wars in the Eastern Cape prevented the proposal from being implemented. In 1904, Leander Starr Jameson issued £50,000 preferred stock to the university from the Rhodes Trust. With this funding, Rhodes University College was founded by an Act of Parliament on 31 May 1904. That's making this university more than 100 years old. The university name references Sizzle Rhodes, a British businessman who heavily aided British imperial interest in South Africa, which led to a controversy starting in 2015. Protests held that year by Rhodes Must Fall led to the University of Cape Town removing a statue of Rhodes and similar protests against the Rhodes legacy occurred at Rhodes University in Grahamstown. Some students and outlets started referring to it as the university currently known as Rhodes. In 2015, the University Council undertook to determine whether or not the institution should change its name, as well as consider several other ways it could deal with the issue. In 2017, the Rhodes University Council voted 15 to 9 in favor of keeping the existing name. While the university agreed with the critics that it cannot dispute that Sizzle John Rhodes was an arch imperialist and white supremacist who treated people of the region as subhuman, it also said that it had long distanced itself from the person and had distinguished itself with the name Rhodes University as one of the world's best. And this is a fact. This is true. Rhodes University is certainly one of the top universities in the world. And we, as South Africans, should be proud of that. Um, the moment you change the name, um, you, you lose all that history, you lose all that value, and certainly brand equity that has been built up, and reputation. The main argument against the change was financial as such a change would cost a significant amount of money and the university was already having trouble with its budget. Furthermore, changing the university name could have an adverse effect on its recognition internationally. That's important. So if the name suddenly changed when students who graduate from the university wanted to do postgraduate studies abroad or to go and work abroad, People may literally just say, well, I've never heard of this university and therefore I'm, not, I'm just going to skip to the next CV on the list because um, I, I don't know um, 
who this you know what the what this university represents and what kind of quality its students uh, represent. But I've, I listened to a interview on I think it was on seven o two um, with Dr. Sizwe Mabizela, um, who was the vice chancellor, and he mentioned that Nelson Mandela attached his name to Sizzle John Rhodes to create the Mandela Rhodes Scholarship. Who are we? He said, who are we to adopt a purist stance on this issue? Do we want to remember the past so that we can learn from it? Or do we want to swipe it under the carpet? I think that's really important. If, if uh, Mandela could make that decision, you know, let's just say to accept the university as an institution and not a representation of Sizzle John Rhodes, who died a hundred years ago. Apiwe, you know, further talks um, about the Fees Must Fall protest at Rhodes University in 2015 and 2016, and then a reference list uh, of the, and rape culture uh, protest that also took place. The real problem is that the university thinks it can handle cases of sexual assault, and then victims get angry when the university fails. In reality, this is there is no way a university can or should handle these cases. It should be to support the victims with counselling and to help the victim report the matter to the police. So basically, Rose Management has got what it deserved. Well, this was a comment on one of the art, an article, I think it was on the Daily Vox. And I agree with this comment, which is that the university uh, shouldn't try to manage um, the incidences of uh, rape and violence on campus themselves. They need to offer the support that they can to the students. They need to get the police involved. That is the job of the police to investigate, to prosecute people. I think it's, it's really, really important that we remember our common law history, which is people are in, in Western civilization, certainly, and South Africa is definitely part of the West, that we are, uh, people are should be treated as innocent until proven guilty. With the rise of social media and the mob tactics online, you will find that uh, pe uh, the opposite is, takes place quite often, that people are presumed guilty, and even if they are proven innocent later on, um, especially with false rape accusations, the, the stain that, le that is left on their reputation can absolutely destroy them, can destroy their prospects and their career um, for the foreseeable future. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if there were some people that ended up committing suicide after some men, specifically, after they've been cleared of false rape accusations. So, next, um, Apiwe talks about how they were called hooligans and uh, uh, p students were, were considered uh, not valuing their education. And that is certainly my impression. Now, when you know that 600 million rand or 45 million dollars worth of damage was caused by these students um, on their own institutions, the universities, you know, what could have been done with that money? You know, with that 600 million, how many students could have been funded? You got to really think about this. Now, what does a hooligan mean? It's a person that has caused trouble and violence. You know, the police were there to stop the violence. Now, I don't want to have a discussion about um, the police brutality or the accusations of police brutality and how certain students were, were supposedly or allegedly tortured, uh, the student leaders of these campaigns. And also, there, are, there were some conspiracy theories, I'll call them, of um, uh, hidden forces behind the unrests of Fees Must Fall. First of all, it's just, I just think that... Um, any sane person looking at this objectively from the outside, right? I mean, what, l let me put it another way. What do the parents of those students think that caused 600 million rands worth of damage? And many of those parents were people working in very low wage jobs, domestic workers or construction work or some kind of factory workers who probably didn't, don't even have matric. They sent their children to universities to study and the risk of the students dropping out because of the protests that happened, missing exams, failing exams. Again, for me, the thing that I find most abhorrent about this article is the, the, just the lack of gratitude, right, from Apiwe, from Apiwe Ngalo and 
all, most of the students, let me say most of the students who are involved in Fees Must Fall. Everybody has a right to education and everybody should have the opportunity to further their education, to see how they have the right to free education. I want to take a, a slight detour here and just talk about my sister. I have a sister that's about um, 12 or 13 years younger than me. Now, I told you that I studied with two loans. One loan was a student loan from First National Bank, and then I had another loan from Nesfes. I had to work for several years to pay that back. My sister's fees were funded by some money left over by an aunt that passed away. And between that money left in a trust, as well as my mother, my sister's fees were completely paid for. And I always felt some resentment about this because my sister got pregnant during her second year and she ended up wasting about 18 months because of this pregnancy and she couldn't complete her studies within the um, four years that she need, that she needed to. But I do believe she is grateful for not having been settled with that debt. It gave her a start in life that she wouldn't otherwise have had, that many, many other students don't have. And this is not even like going into the topic of the student debt bubble in the US and how they are coping with it, because I believe it's like a $1.5 trillion um, uh, uh, bubble that's just waiting to burst. Let me let me just talk, go back to um, being described hooligans and not valuing the education. Now, as I said from a cursory read of her blog, she is a social justice warrior. And I just want to quote Thomas Sowell, um, an economist and author um, who wrote a book on social justice. And I'm, I'll link to, at the bottom of this, I'll link to his book as well as a, a, a lecture that he gave many years ago on, on social justice. He calls it cos cosmic justice. So the key passage from Sowell's 1999 book, The Quest for Cosmic Justice, gets to the heart of the in invalidating arguments advanced by uh, leftist crusaders, which is uh, people like Apiwe. Ngalo, often referred to as social justice warriors, or more briefly, SJW. Okay, I think you can just um, reference that yourself, um, but I think he has the best um, uh, answer to that. And to me, um, it's that, that always comes through is that sense of ingratitude. Here is something like, um, something further, you know, violence is violence and the law and order comes first. Fees must fall, never made a compelling economic argument for free education. At best, uh, they could provide free, um, we could provide free primary education, you know, like primary schools. Um, a lot of public schools in South Africa are now providing free education. However, the demands of the students will increase the tax bur burden, and this is just simply in in realistic, unrealistic. There, there's been a couple of articles written about this, is that if government had to agree to provide free education, like free university education, there would not be enough money left to pay the grants, uh, the millions and millions of people, the grants that they have. And um, if they had to increase the tax burden, I think there would be a tremendous amount of people who would feel resentful uh, towards these ungrateful students. Um, I just want to take another example. Like when I was in university, I managed to reduce some of my uh, uh, burden, uh, financial burden, by achieving certain percentages, you know, and receiving certain discounts on my fees when I achieved 60%, 70%, and 80% on certain subjects. And I think most universities in South Africa provide some kind of a, a rebate system based on performance. You know, she ends off this article by talking about um, having men in power and that they tend to have fragile masculinities. And I think that's a theme that runs through her blog, her writing, um, you know, and it is so, to me, it is just so stereotypical of what I've seen in this uh, social justice warrior uh, movement, um, leftist movement, whatever you want to call it, that has been rising up and has been spoken about quite widely by, by people like Jordan Peterson. And um, my last comment here is, you know, why are we seeing the organized effort to snuff out masculinity? This is from Jordan Peterson. Uh, you could say it's a response to fragile masculinity. Why are we seeing an organized effort to snuff out masculinity? Because it's easy to mistake masculine competence for the tyranny that the hypothetical that hypothetically drives the patriarchy, Jordan Peterson said. He nailed it. In other words, everyone 
but men are victims. Culture is toxic, thanks feminism. Okay, let me try and summarize the problem that I have with this article, uh, graduating from varsity after fees must fall is a bittersweet experience. So first of all, you damn well graduated. Be grateful for that. Secondly, you have a job. You're a junior reporter at the Daily Maverick. But thirdly, stop blaming other people, right? Take some personal responsibility. You can't blame society. I think there's a quote somewhere, I don't remember by who, but it says like for every finger that you point at others, there's like three fingers pointing back at you. This is the point that Apiwe Ngalo misses, right? The more she points and blames fragile masculinity, um, white men who are in charge of universities, the less chances are that she's actually going to do something about it. It's, you know, it's like one of the things that frustrates me and pisses me off the most about social media, which is that it is social media is the place that most people go to complain and vent their frustrations. But it's very rare that you read about what they've actually done about it. You know, and when I read articles like this and when I read comments where people are complaining and blaming, I remember uh, something that was said by Napoleon Hill that um, complainers just attract more complainers. But also, the more you complain, the less chance that you will actually do something about it. I'd have more respect for you if you told me what you're actually doing about it besides just complaining. I'd have more respect for me if you told me what you've actually done to change things and what you are doing now besides writing and complaining on blogs and on the internet that most of the people that you're trying to reach don't have access to or don't bother with because they've got more important things to do like feeding their families than usual. So anyway, this week's episode has gone on a bit longer than usual. I just want to remind you, if you like this video, please like this video. Um, uh, please share it with people and also um, please support my Patreon. Mm, I'm still looking for my first subscriber. I'm still working on that. Um, but with your support, I'll continue to do more of this. Um, I'm going to alternate this and make topics that are relevant to people outside South Africa as well. But I'm starting with some topics that about things that I know. And um, I really appreciate you watching this video. So please uh, post your comment about a PWA's article, especially after reading it. I'm going to link to it and I'm going to put some references in, in the description. And yeah, as I said, please um, consider supporting me on Patreon. You know, just uh, one or two dollars. Um, that'll be much appreciated, much appreciated. So that's me over and out. That's all folks.